Hey, this is Clint. Welcome to Sweetcast. So first thing I got to say, welcome to all my new subscribers and viewers. I've been getting more and more comments both on Twitter and in the comment section of my videos that I've got, uh, you know, new people watching my videos that aren't necessarily associated with Comicsgate or even they're, they're not even into comics. They're just here for, I guess, the social commentary. So welcome. I'm glad to have you, even if you disagree. Now, if you disagree, I especially want to talk to you. Um, if you consider yourself a reasonable person and you're interested in discussion and you want to have a reasonable discussion, uh, hear me out. This is important. So I've had my YouTube channel for a couple months and I've put in a lot of work to make videos um, and to get subscribers. I've put so much work into this, in fact. I've been doing it every single day, every day, making videos, researching videos, editing videos, posting them, uh, talking to people on Twitter, trying to promote my videos, and it's been a lot of work. And I've had a lot of help from a lot of great people, including and especially all of my subscribers. So thank you. So I've reached the milestone where I can monetize this channel. I have over 1,000 subscribers and I have over 4,000 hours of view time. Now I've submitted for monetization last week. I'm still waiting to hear back and they say this is supposed to take about a month, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Because even though I consider myself a reasonable person who happens just to be moderately uh, conservative, this is unacceptable right now to large corporations and to really th apparently the mainstream of public opinion. Yellow Flash has, has a YouTube channel and he waited for over a year to get approved for monetization. Over a year. This time next year, I might not still be approved uh, to be monetized. Now, this is particularly disappointing to me because many of you know that I am working on a comic. I want to uh, get a comic book published that's going to be politic free and it's just to be a fun story uh, because I there's not a place for me in mainstream publishing. No one's interested in publishing somebody. Uh, that has my points of view. And so I wanted to use this money to, uh, you know, monetize and be able to pay an artist uh, for the hard work that they do. Uh, but I'm going to have to find another way to earn money in order to pay an artist because YouTube is probably not going to monetize my channel for a very, very long time, if at all. So for any of you that complain that uh, people within Comicsgate or, uh, you know, anybody that's just against social justice politics complains too much that uh, we're being unfairly targeted and you think we're making this up we're not making it up Th this is actually happening now the conversation of deplatforming uh comes up a lot and i've seen it especially a lot lately when it comes to richard meyer also known as your boy zach now he's made a lot of enemies uh, he started by critiquing comics, and I think more broadly, and this was his problem, was critiquing identity politics. And because of that, he's got a mob of angry people that want to see him deplatformed. Now, the definition of deplatform is it's a form of boycott. And I, I read the definition earlier. I don't have it now. Uh, you're welcome to Google it if you'd like to. It's a form of boycott. However, deplatforming has moved beyond that. This is an example of somebody... Uh, basically boycotting me. I've been blocked on Twitter by Golden, a Comics in the Golden Age podcast. I have no idea who these people are. I've never even listened to the podcast. In fact, I've never even had an interaction with them on Twitter. So I'm not sure why I'm blocked. However, it's their right to block me. They have unsubscribed to me and they've made it so I am unsubscribed to them. And that's perfectly fine. It's just a single individual that's doing this. Now, the problem is this has been taken to the next level. It's not a form of boycott when you want to uh, influence the way people make money. You want to influence people's employers. You want to influence platforms that people are using to make a living. This goes beyond that. This is uh, seeking for total destruction. And so we've seen a lot of people like this SJW Punisher show up, just like SJW Spider-Man, just like Renfamous. There's so many of them, and they're starting to become more because they're being encouraged by the powers that be. Uh, these people are all hoping that they're going to get the nod from Marvel, uh, from important Marvel executives, or from comic book pros. And that might sound crazy, but they're already getting it. I mean, Renfamous 
is getting nods from Joe Casada. He'll he'll say things to her. She's bragging about trying to get, or that she's going to get a job at Marvel. This is no secret, and so it's no surprise to me that there's more of these people showing up, trying to grandstand on destroying somebody's life. Now, despite the many flaws that are within Comics Gate, and the many flaws or the many uh, you know things that could have been said better, I have never seen anybody try to make somebody lose their job within comics gate i've never seen zach uh, go out and try to make somebody lose their job if you can find an example of that i would love to see it i have never seen such a thing and his quote here great idea i'd love to make zach homeless f comics gate this this goes above and beyond you know and it'd be one thing if it was just the more visible people like uh like your boy Zach, or like Ethan Van Skyver, but it's not. I have these people come after me on Twitter, even though I think, personally, I'm extremely mild, but people have made a boogeyman out of comics gate in their head, and they don't care. They're willing to apply it generously wherever anybody disagrees with them. Here's another thing here. Uh, you know, I just looked at the hashtag deplatform. Does this look at all familiar to anything? This looks like the kind of flyer you would see in time of war, the kind of flyer that people would call racist now. Sort of the, you know, disgusting artwork, trying to make something look evil. They've even painted a swastika on this frog. And of course, they're using violence. The reason you see these things in times of war, it's no mistake. This is propaganda. This is trying to influence people into thinking a certain way. And more importantly, show somebody or your enemy as inhuman you've got a frog with a swastika right it's an ugly frog with a swastika and this is supposed to represent nazis or like the fascists the problem is when people are calling me a fascist daily i get called a fascist i get called a bigot i get called a transphobe uh, get called racist all because i make videos and i'm mildly critical of identity politics Deplatforming has evolved, um, and what it has turned into is not good. This is evil. Uh, Deplatforming somebody like Alex Jones, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a big Alex Jones fan. I think he's he can be funny sometimes. I've liked to enjoyed watching some of the interviews with him on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, I disagree with him on so much, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories that he's had that I. I mean, I just think are nonsensical. Um, I don't lose sleep over it, though. And, it, and I don't understand how people get so upset about Alex Jones that they have to make sure he, he is out of sight and out of mind. Now, Alex Jones has a lot of money, and I have no doubt that he's going to be just fine after being deplatformed. The problem is when people think that deplatforming works, when they see it as a positive thing, they're going to start using it on smaller and smaller figures, uh, smaller and smaller people with smaller platforms. And this kind of deplatforming has a much bigger impact. Milo Yiannopoulos is another example. I don't agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, I find him entertaining. He's definitely a provocateur. And if you can't see that he's specifically saying stuff to, uh, you know, get a rise out of people, then you've got something wrong. You need to reevaluate. So who's next? Someone like Sargon of Akkad. Uh, he said one of the unspeakable words. Uh, one of the same unspeakable words that uh, in junior high, you know, if you read any Mark Twain book, uh, I read Huck Finn in high school for crying out loud, and the same word is there. Now that's an unspeakable word. So Patreon can refuse to exchange money to anybody, uh, somebody that wants to support somebody else if they say an unspeakable word. Now imagine if uh, credit card companies said that you could no longer exchange money. Uh, this This is a huge deal because that, at the end of the day, that, you know, MasterCard, Discover Card, these kinds of companies, uh, they're the ones that control the transfer of money. If you're unable to uh, be platformed with one of those companies, if they decide that uh, you don't deserve to have money transferred to you, you are essentially broke and dead. You cannot do anything in today's world. And what about mailing cash to somebody that you, you want to support in an envelope? Is it then the post office job to stop that transfer from happening uh, because 
hate speech is being promoted. I, I think, honestly, it comes down to one thing. We have to agree that the even the most vile of speech, barring violence or in, like obvious and direct incitement of violence, but political speech needs to be free speech. No matter how vile you believe it is, and no matter how much you don't want somebody to be saying it, you don't have to listen to it. But that person has a right to say it. Now, if you disagree with me and you're still watching, I think this is the most important part of all. It seriously worries me how many uh, people that are really into to, uh, social justice and uh, uh, identity politics haven't actually read Rules for Radicals. Now, this book was written a while ago. I mean, this was what uh, written in 1972 by Saul Alinsky. 1972. And these rules are followed to a T today. Let's look through some of them. Rules for Radicals has various things. Among them is the use of symbol construction to strengthen the unity within an organization. Does this sound familiar? He could draw on loyalty to a particular church or religious affiliation to create a structured organization within which to operate. Okay, so these symbols are just like identity politics. All these intersecting intersecting identities. These are absolutely symbols. Uh, and before you disagree with me, let's read the very next sentence. The reason being that symbols by which communities could identify themselves created structured organizations that were easier to mobilize in imp implementing direct action, right? It's for communities that identify themselves so that you can call them to action. So if you call somebody a homophobe, you have directly asked a group of people that identify with one of your symbols to direct action. Once the community was united behind a common symbol, Alinsky would find a common enemy for the community to be united against. Again, this is the word community again. A lot of people have given Ethan Van Skyver some guff for his, uh, his problems with the word community and how Comicsgate is called a community. I think he has some valid concerns. Making common enemies like, uh, you know, a racist or a straight white man or, you know, just sort of creating the ultimate evil of identities that you can't even control. You've created somebody uh, that your communities can hate. So every time I'm called a racist or a homophobic or a bigot, I get tackled by people on Twitter. Strangers, people who don't watch my videos, they don't know me, but because this uh, direct call to action, that they've sounded the alarm, and now I'm being tackled. Once the community has united behind a common symbol, Alinsky would find a common enemy for the community to unite against. The use of a common enemy against community was another theme for Rules of Radicals as uniting element in communities. You're going to keep seeing the word community pop up over and over and over. We're a common enemy. Now, if you buy into these identity politics, I mean, right now you should be getting the chills. Does it, does it creep you out that in 1972, somebody wrote the rules, they wrote your programming right here, it's been written. This is the coding that you're following. It has been fed into higher, higher education. It's been taught to students. Those students move to corporations and they get jobs. And that's where this ideology takes hold. This isn't some conspiracy theory. This is literally an explanation of what things are like today. This is done on purpose. Okay, so I realize that there are going to be people that say I wear a tinfoil hat and I'm no better than Alex Jones. To me, this is this is absolutely plain English. These are rules for radicals. These are the exact rules that you follow now. Sorry if this is a little bit of a, of a downer of a video. Um, I'm really upset uh, by some of this stuff. It does bother me. This is one of the reasons I started the YouTube channel in the first place. If you've got uh, criticisms, by all means criticize. Uh, but I, I do definitely have a problem when you're trying to deplatform somebody and make it so they not only can they not speak or criticize, but that so they have no livelihood. If you're into this stuff and you don't catch it, um, I think you're going to be disappointed with what you're willing to do in order to appease these people. Because uh, this, you, you've got your programming. Uh, it's your turn, your time to decide if you're going to literally be an NPC and follow that programming. Or if you're going to step aside and, and be a free-thinking individual. 
So thank you for listening. I promise next video I'm going to be more positive, but this was a really important topic and I think that it has to be talked about. We have to shed, shed light on this. So thank you very much. I will see you next time.